In this video, we're going to start to learn how to fly and fight the DCS AH-64D. Speed raise, town six, you're cleared to engage. Lead is a rolling in, engaging south, north, left in, right out. The following video is for entertainment purposes only. There will be no specific discussion about ranges, technical data, or aircraft survivability equipment, otherwise known as ASE. Questions of this nature will not be answered, and discussions will be deleted. Thanks. Alright everybody, welcome aboard the H-64D, and we're just going to do a quick cockpit orientation, uh, take a look at all of the uh, buttons and switches and knobs. Uh, we're not going to go super in-depth, uh, because we are going to be doing uh, several tutorials talking about some of these things. Uh, in more general, but the uh, intent right now is just kind of give us a general overview of the cockpit. So we'll start here in the back seat and we'll start on the left side. We've got our lighting control panel and you can see on the left side we've got our external lights and our interior lights on the right side. And we'll talk about these more in a video for uh, night operations. Let me go ahead and just uh, move these power levers out of the way and uh, we can see here we've got our stores jettison. Uh, so this is a selectable jettison versus the jettison that we have here, which is an emergency jettison on the collective. Uh, so the way this would work is if we wanted to, for whatever reason, uh, jettison the uh, left outbound store, we could uh, click that button and then hit the jettison and it'll, it'll light up. All right, so like I said, we've got the power levers here. So we've got power lever one and two. Uh, and then right here, we've got the APU start. So we'd lift that switch up, hold that button down, and APU would uh, get started for us. And then these are the engine start and ignition override. All right, forward of that, this is our battery switch. And you can see it's got three positions off battery and external power. Uh, normally there would be a key that actually goes in there and then you'd uh, rotate it onto the battery switch. Uh, before I forget, here's our uh, outside air temperature gauge. And just forward of our battery switch is the rotor brake control. You can see off, brake, and lock. Uh, typically this is used during shutdown uh, once you get the rotor below 50%, you can go ahead and turn on the rotor brake and it'll get the rotor uh, slowed down for you. But it, it can also be used during startup, uh, prevents uh, some torque issues on, on ships is what I've been told. I've never actually used it for startup, uh, but uh, I've talked to people that have definitely it said uh, on ship board operations, this is pretty useful. All right, just past that, we've got our emergency panel. So these are just some, some basically hotkeys, if you will. Uh, we can uh, hit this button, it'll turn the radios to guard, uh, set our transponder to emergency. Uh, we can zeroize our equipment, and uh, this is sets up our emergency hydraulics if we were to lose hydraulic power. All right, forward of that, we've got our tailwheel unlock indicator, and we'll talk more about that here in a bit. And our night vision system mode, uh, we can select from off, norm, and fixed. All right, just past that, we've got our keyboard unit, and that's going to come into uh, use in a variety of other future lessons, uh, our canopy jettison. Our armament control, we've got our arm safe and our ground override. And then just below that is our video panel. So we can control the uh, brightness contrast of the IHADs, the symbology, and the FLIR. And we'll talk more about that later. All right, we've got our two MPDs, our multi-purpose displays. And the one thing that I do want to mention about this as it comes important uh, for the rest of our tutorials is the way that we sort of reference these numbers. Now you'll hear the the fighter guys talk about OSB 12 and 17. I, and I don't know where that crap is. This is row T for top, row B for bottom, Lima and Romeo. And it just starts uh, from the left to right or top to bottom. So this is T1, T2, T3, R1, R2, R3, etc. And of course, you've got these uh, buttons here that'll take you immediately to some, uh, uh, some pages that you're going to go to a lot, particularly your weapons, your TSD, and your video. Here we've got our fire detection extinguishing system. It's going to let us know if we've got a fire in the engine one, engine two compartment, or the APU. Uh, we can activate that and uh, extinguish those fires. To the right, we've got our upfront display, or UFD. And it's got a variety of controls. We'll talk about that again in the future. Our master warn, master caution are right here in the middle. Off to the right, we've got a master eye zero. It's going to zeroize the entire aircraft, all the systems. And we've got our standby instruments here on the right. Down below, we've got our comms control panel. We can change the volumes for our radios. We can change the master volume, turn off the squelch. There's a variety of things that we'll talk about here in the future. This little lump here on the right side is actually where the uh, HDU goes. So it uh, it's plugged into the aircraft all the time. There'd be cables here. And uh, basically, you just take it off your helmet, stick it in there. It just kind of pops open. There's a little uh, recessed groove in there. You drop it into there. 
uh, I should say, gently place it, and then you put the uh, the cover on top of it so you don't step on it on the way out. And of course, we've got our trusty M4. Taking a look at the top, we have our standby compass. This is our boresight reticle, which we'll talk about more in a bit, and our CMOS control panel. As we can see, the door is open, and if we want to shut that door, we just pull this handle. In actuality, you would actually release the uh, door up here at this handle and this locks it into place if you wanted to open the door then you would turn this handle push it out it kind of locks in uh, with these here and then to release that pressure is when you would uh, hit this handle so it's kind of a two-part contraption all right jumping into the front seat we're gonna have a lot of the same controls so uh, we'll take a look back here you can see that we've got another stores jettison panel operates the same way We've got some internal lighting. You notice that it's just internal. It's just for this cockpit, the front seat. Uh, we do not have external lighting control. And we've got the same tail wheel and NVS mode select switch. And notice uh, here with the uh, power levers, we do not have a way to start the aircraft or the APU from the front seat. Same emergency panel, same keyboard panel, two MPDs, our fire detection, our armament panel, and of course the TDAC, which we'll be talking about in greater detail in the future, uh, and also WAGS has covered uh, in his videos. Our Master Warn, Master Caution is here. Our Boresight Reticle, our upfront display, our Zero Eyes, our Comms Panel, and most importantly, the Windshield Wiper. The processor is really just kind of deep dive and probably not too important in DCS. And then we've got our HDU uh, compartment here on the right and our trusty M4. All right, guys, I had fully intended to run through a startup of the engines. However, the current build that I'm using for these videos, uh, there's some, some bugs within the build and it's just not going to look right. And I don't want to confuse anyone. So uh, what I'm going to do is just kind of skip over that part. We'll start up with the engines running uh, in anticipation and hope that the release that you guys get your hands on here uh, whenever you're watching this video that you'll have the, the full build that allows you to do the engine start. And once all that gets sorted, we can uh, come back and do another video and walk through that engine start. It's pretty easy. All right, guys, we've gotten the aircraft started up and uh, I'm kind of struggling of how to explain this next part. So. Uh, what I want to talk about is the tailwheel, but I also need to talk about symbology before we do that. So we're going to start with our hover symbology, then we're going to transition to the tailwheel, and then we're going to taxi out and talk about the other symbology. All right, so we're looking at our symbology, and a lot of this is sort of uh, basic stuff. You've got the uh, heading tape up top. Uh, to the left, you've got that percentage there. That's our actual torque percentage, and that's really the number that we uh, live by. As I increase the collective, we're seeing the increase in torque. Uh, that's generated by the uh, the increase of the lift component of the main rotor blades, which means the engine's going to have to work harder to keep them spinning at 100%. Uh, well, you'll see indicated 101%, but you know basically the optimal number of the blades uh, need to spin to maintain the lift required to do what the aircraft needs us to do. And uh, looking down the left, you've got that zero. That's going to be our our airspeed uh, down below we can see that we uh, the pilot HMD we get the range get the high action display we'll be talking more about that later and back over to the right we've got our vertical scale tape there with our altitude uh, in uh, above ground level and uh, above that you don't have a MSL but we'll see that pop up later but what I really want to talk about is the center you've got that line of sight and that is uh, going to function in a lot of different ways for us. Uh, one is to basically point the aircraft to things that we're interested in. And we'll talk more about that with weapons and the TADs. Uh, but also it is a top-down representation of our aircraft. And you can see that circle there. I uh, can't really move it too much just because we're not moving. But that circle is, uh, think of it as our cyclic. And that is our acceleration cue. So that is what we are telling the aircraft we want to accelerate to and the direction. And then you're going to see a little line come right out of the center and chase that circle. And that's going to be our velocity. All right. So uh, what I want you to do when we start to taxi out is pay attention to that circle and the line that follows it. And then the last thing that I want you to do is sort of imagine a box. So we've, we've talked about the heading tape and the vertical scale and all these things. Uh, I want you to think about that open area as a box. 
and when that circle reaches the box in hover mode that is six knots and then that line is going to chase it and that's telling us uh, where we're actually at with that so we'll we'll come back to that i know that sounds kind of uh kind of confusing uh, especially when i can't demonstrate it but we've got a taxi out first and that brings us to our tailwheel so a lot of times uh, for helicopters we're parked this way particularly if we're armed uh, we're going to be pointing towards some sort of berm or something and so we're going to have to back taxi now most times you're going to have some sort of crew chief out with you that he's going to give you uh you know hand gestures and let you know or you're going to have your wingman and he's looking out the window and he can tell you that you're clear clear back and things like that and tell you when you're clear to turn uh, but right now we're just kind of taking it on faith that nothing's behind us uh, and what we're going to do is start to back taxi uh, but we need to talk about the tailwheel so you can see up here in our upfront display uh, it's letting us know what setting the tailwheel is at right now so it is lock select now there's two ways we can interact with this we've got the tailwheel button here uh, but we also have one on the collective kind of like a, a pinky switch uh, and that's really the the one that we prefer to use uh, but that light is going to tell us the actual status of the tailwheel so when it lights up it's going to let us know that it's actually unlocked and then that is letting us know what we have selected now when we pick the aircraft up uh, just gently uh, to take some pressure off of the wheels so that we can start to taxi uh, that message may go away uh, because of the uh, weight on wheels but uh, we know that we've got it selected to lock and then I'm gonna push that button and we can see that we've selected unlock and the tail wheel is now unlocked so I'm gonna select lock again and it's showing us that we're locked so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep it locked for the moment I'm gonna increase my torque to about 25 or so percent and it kind of depends on your weight but you know 25 to 28 is going to get you where you need to be uh, we're pretty light because we don't have anything on board and I'm going to start bringing my cyclic back and you can see that acceleration cue that I was talking about and that line is chasing it all right so right now we're at that three to four knots and we're holding that and I'm just going to take the cyclic out and let that all center back up and of course, if I want to stop, I can apply my wheel brakes if I needed to, or I can just take the collective out and drop it down. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and try and turn. Uh, we're going to turn our tail to the left and our nose to the right and get on this taxiway. So I'm going to continue back a little bit, and then as I do, I'm going to hit the unlock. So think of the tail wheel as just a caster wheel, just a free spinning wheel that has a pin that goes down into a hole. It's just seated into a hole. When it is locked, that pin is in the hole. When you select unlock, that pin rises up and it allows the tail to spin free or the wheel to spin free. And then uh, we'll talk about relocking it here in a second because there's a little bit of a trick to it. So, all right, we're gonna pull up that torque a little bit more and we're gonna start bringing the cyclic back. And now I'm gonna unlock. And we've selected unlock. And now I'm gonna go ahead and start kicking my pedals and you can see that little that little shutter and if you think about that caster wheel it's had to spin 180 degrees right so that's going to cause the tail to make a little bit of a, a bump and that's what it's done so I've taken the pressure back off the weight on wheels uh, or putting it back on I should say and we can see that we have unlock selected and the tail wheel is unlocked so right now if I taxi forward and I put in pedal that tail is going to move free. All right, so think about that caster wheel. It's kind of stuck out to the side. All right, so I can move free. So I'm going to get up on this taxiway line. I'm going to control my speed by just paying attention to that acceleration cue and that velocity vector and get me on the line. Now what I could do is just keep fighting this all the way. Or I could get lined up and go ahead and lock the tail wheel. Now, again, I said that there's a pin that has to seat into a hole. So if the if the wheel is not straight, that hole and that pin are not going to line up. So what you really have to do to lock it is you can't just lock it uh, and it's just going to happen automatically. You're going to have to initiate the lock, which I'm going to do now. I'm pushing the button and the light is out. So we've been going straight, which means that wheel's in position. Now, if we were in the middle of a turn and I hit that lock, I've got to wait, essentially, uh, or the wheel has to get into position before that pin will drop into place. All right. So, again, just to summarize, it's a wheel with a pin into a hole. If it's not lined up properly, it's not going to lock. Now, once we've got it locked, uh, we have a little bit of authority 
uh, just by uh, pressing on our pedals and using the thrust generated by the tail rotor. Uh, it's not advisable. Uh, we'll just continue and then when we need to turn, we can unlock that tail wheel. Now one thing I will suggest that you do not do is apply a lot of pedal and then unlock the tail wheel and I'll demonstrate why. So we're cruising forward here at about nine knots. I'm going to go ahead and put in some left pedal and then I'm going to unlock the tail wheel. Alright, so immediately we start to turn. Because that thrust is there, the only thing holding it back essentially is that pin on the tail wheel. So I'm going to lock it, continue forward, and it's locked. I'm going to try to demonstrate here uh, how long it can take to lock. So I'm going to put it into a turn, and then I'm going to go ahead and hit the lock. Alright, there. So we finally went straight enough for it to, to seat itself. If we go into a tighter turn, locked. Nothing's happening, nothing's happening because we're still in that turn. The wheel is not straight. I'm going to straighten the aircraft out. And there it goes, locked. Alright, so let's get back into the symbology. We've talked about the hover symbology. Uh, what I want you to now do when we uh, pick this aircraft up to a hover is pay attention to that line of sight, pay attention to that acceleration cue and the velocity vector. And then, of course, uh, look off to the right there at our altitude. We're going to look for about a four or five uh, foot uh, hover height. So I'm going to start bringing in the torque. And I'm just kind of paying attention to the outside cues and I'm paying attention to that acceleration cue. And I'm just picking the aircraft up. And we can see just from that acceleration cue that we're sort of drifting off to the right. Now one thing that I would suggest is don't stare at this and try to hover. Uh, at least not initially. Go ahead and look outside. Look at those visual cues just like you would with any other helicopter. Got a little high there. I'm going to bring it back down. Uh, but the symbology is important, particularly at night when you don't have those visual cues. So go ahead and start getting used to uh, using it and just kind of cross-referencing the outside world and your symbology so it'll help you. Now if we wanted to slide to the right, we just again move that cyclic to the right and we can see that acceleration cue and that velocity vector moving off to the right. Now I'm going to come hard left. You can see that acceleration cue outdistance that velocity vector and the velocity vector races to catch up to it. So they're not linked uh, in, in the sense that they, they, they have to touch all the time. Uh, it just has to do more with the magnitude of the input that you put in. So if I put in a strong input, that line is going to race up there. And once it hits that six knots, it's going to reset uh, the circle. But you can see that line is not really telling you anything. So at that point, we're going to go ahead and transition forward flight and move into the transition mode. All right, so before we get back into that, uh, let's talk about uh, hover bob up. So I'm bringing us back down to this runway. I've got us back up to hover symbology. And we'll just settle the aircraft here somewhere. And a thing that you do need to have mapped is your symbology select switch. It's a uh, three-way switch. If you press in on the Z-axis, it'll bring the flight page up on your left MPD. But if you hit up, it's going to cycle through transition and cruise mode. If you hit down, it's going to transition through hover and hover pop up. So tapping it down once takes us to hover. Tapping it down a second time takes us to hover pop up. And so that's a, a 12 foot square box that drops right where we hit that button. So wherever I told it to drop a box, that's where it dropped the box. And it's letting us know how far we've drifted. So uh, the best way I can say to uh, how to use this box is pretend you're the circle. You want to be in that box. Just keep manipulating your controls to keep the circle in the box and the aircraft will eventually uh, follow that circle and stay in the box with you. All right, if I wanted to leave the hover bob up box and go back to hover mode, I could just hit down again on the symbology select switch. Now I'm in hover mode. And if I wanted to go back into the hover bob up, I just hit down on that symbology select switch. And if I wanted another box here, I would just go down twice and just cycle through. All right, so now we're going to transition to forward flight and we'll go into that transition mode. So once again, I'm in hover symbology. The acceleration cue has reached the end, six knots. I'm going to go ahead and hit transition mode. And now you can see that we've got some additional symbology that's appeared, uh, primarily the flight path vector. Uh, you can see kind of heading off to the sky there. It's, that's our direction of flight. So that's an instantaneous view of where the aircraft is going to end up if you don't do things differently. So the aircraft's a little out of trim. Uh, it's pretty windy. And we'll come around to the left. And some other symbology that has appeared is we've got this uh, horizon line. 
And then we have waypoint data down there at the left. You can see uh, Whiskey 02 is 7.7 .7 kilometers and our ground speed and then the uh, time of flight to that waypoint based on that ground speed. So we're gonna continue around and looking around and there's our waypoint. If you look up at our heading tape, you can see that little open uh, uh, pyramid. That is a cue towards our waypoint. And then you've got that baseball diamond that is the actual waypoint. Now in your mission editor, of course, uh, I didn't do that, but you can set the altitude just like any other waypoint in DCS. Uh, but setting that at ground level is going to be helpful when you try to use a waypoint as an acquisition source. So at this point, everything looks pretty much the same as hover mode, just a few additions. Uh, you notice our altitude is 330 feet. And again, that's uh, above ground level. We do not in this aircraft have a uh, mean sea level indicator in transition mode. Uh, we can only see that in cruise mode. So we'll go ahead and move to cruise mode. And this may look more familiar to the uh, fighter pilot type community of DCS. Uh, but you can see that a lot of the same symbology around the edges. But now you've got that pitch ladder. And uh, you do have that MSL altitude up there at the top right, 660 feet. Um, now, typically Apache guys do not fly around with this unless they're doing some sort of very extreme maneuvering with the nose. Uh, I typically only use it if I'm uh, up high and I'm, I'm diving for cover or something. I might flip it up just to give me some, some extra situational awareness of, of my nose attitude uh, and then immediately go back into transition mode. But there's really nothing here that's helpful other than the MSL altitude. Uh, so typically we just stay in this transition mode. Now I know some people are wondering uh, in some of the videos how come the flight path vector is not directly in front of the aircraft. And part of that has to do with the winds, of course, just like any aircraft, uh, any, even fixed wing aircraft will, will crab uh, to the side a little bit. Uh, but with helicopters, there's a little bit more aerodynamics factors involved, uh, particularly torque, uh, just the shape of the aircraft. As you look at the Apache, it's, it is asymmetrical in shape. And then, of course, uh, with the Apache, that, that tail rotor back there uh, up high, just kind of causing a rolling motion and causing a yaw in the aircraft. So it is not uncommon, uh, depending on the winds, uh, to see that flight path vector off to the side, to see that velocity vector, that line off to one side. Uh, but that is having the aircraft in trim. And we can look down at the bottom and see that our ball is centered. So the aircraft is in aerodynamic trim. Now you may have heard of a term uh, nose to tail trim. So as we look at the aircraft, I'm gonna go to an external. It's kind of hard to tell, but our nose is a little bit off to the left in this flight. So we don't have what we call nose to tail trim. So we'll go ahead and put it in the nose to tail trim. And the easiest way to do that is to just put in some pedal. And now we can see that our flight path vector uh, will start to line up with the direction of flight. Additionally, that velocity vector, that line will go straight up. And now we are in nose to tail trim, but you can tell that the aircraft is now canted off to the side in order to make that happen. And again, we've, we've got some winds today. Uh, so this would be a nose to tail trim situation and it's mostly useful for down low, uh, close to the trees. So you don't have your tail hanging out to one side, uh, but also could be valuable for shooting because at the end of the day, the rockets come out towards the nose. They don't really care as much about if the aircraft's in trim, uh, so much as the rocket pods are pointing in the right direction. So you're going to, uh, make these changes based on what you're trying to do with the aircraft. All right. So we're approaching waypoint two. We're getting pretty close to it. And uh, the aircraft should automatically cycle to waypoint three for us. And we'll talk more about navigation later. Uh, but just wanted to show you, again, the basics of, of getting the aircraft and, and flying it around. So we'll wait for it to cycle. And there it goes. All right, so now we've got that open carrot off to our left. We can just go ahead and look, and then we can see it show up in our HDU. Turn the aircraft. And we are ready to go to waypoint three. Now, once again, with the uh, severe winds that I've put into this mission, uh, we can see that uh, we're having to put a lot of crab angle in order to have the aircraft fly in a straight line to our location. And the symbology just makes this super easy for us. Uh, we just, again, line up that flight path vector with where we want to go. Uh, and we can even use that vertically. So if we need to clear some obstacles, make sure that that flight path vector goes over the obstacles. If we're trying to climb to a certain point, uh, make sure that it's up where that point is. Uh, but you can see, you know, the nose of the aircraft is pointing way off here. 
uh, what are we, 20 or so degrees uh, to the right. And the aircraft is flying uh, pretty much straight to where we need it to go. It's just that we're looking in the wrong place. And this is where things like the Penvis can come in pretty handy. Even during the day, uh, we can flip on the Penvis and I can see through the superstructure of the aircraft. I can see through the, uh, the railing here. Uh, not necessarily something that you would do a lot during the day, but it is an option, particularly if you're down low and you're having, you know, worried about some sort of uh, obstacles or something like that. And then, of course, at night, this is why I say flying an Apache at night is actually a lot easier because you can actually see a lot more. All right, guys, one of the things I get asked a lot about is traffic patterns and helicopters. Uh, typically, we don't do a whole lot of traffic patterns in a normal airport. You just kind of come straight into certain places. Uh, but at a heliport, you'll probably do a lot more standard traffic patterns. But the, the point here really is that a helicopter can land wherever it needs to. And uh, that can be uh, super valuable for ATC who just wants us to kind of get out of the way. Um, we're going to take a look at the winds. So winds being reported by the aircraft are 223 at 44 knots, which is uh, obviously pretty strong. I uh, set them high just to make it easier to kind of visualize some of these things that we're talking about. I wouldn't recommend that uh, you're flying too many combat missions at a 40 plus knot winds. Uh, but we're going to uh, swing the aircraft around and we'll just say that ATC wants us to land here at this intersection. So I'm going to give myself plenty of space. But this flight path vector is going to be uh, very helpful in getting us to the right spot. Uh, all we're going to do is essentially, I, I like to call it like kind of playing a mini game, is we're just going to manipulate the controls so that that flight path vector ends up where we want it. And we're just going to continue to manipulate the controls to keep it there uh, until we get down to a very low airspeed, transition to hover mode, and then uh, execute our landing on the spot. So we'll go ahead and start our right turn, and we'll start to take out some altitude and just drag that flight path vector down to where we want it. All right, so we're going to turn inbound towards our landing area. And again, I'm just manipulating the controls to slow the aircraft down and start to work that flight path vector where I want to touch down. And I'm kind of adjusting uh, just based on those strong winds that we have. Uh, it's now being reported at 134 at 44, so that's not helpful to have those kinds of wind shifts. <laughs> Uh, but again, we're doing this for demonstration purposes, just to show uh, those angles. So we've got the flight path vector where we want it. Obviously, we've got a heck of a crab angle going here. So as we get a little bit lower, we're going to swing the aircraft around and get that nose to tail trim so that we can line up. And again, I could turn on my penvis right now and look through all this stuff, but I'm pretty confident I can see where I'm going. So we've got the aircraft nice and slow, nice and steady, not pulling a lot of power. And we're getting below 100 feet. I'm going to go ahead and just start sneaking the nose over to the right. 50 feet lane alignment, so this is the direction that I want to land. And we're just continuing down. When we get to that low airspeed, we'll go ahead and transition to hover mode. And try and continue down. And there's touchdown. Apply a little bit of wheel brakes just to help us stop. And there we go. All right, guys, well, flying the Apache is secretly easy. Uh, I know it seems more complicated than it is. Uh, hopefully that this and the uh, lessons that I'm going to release uh, are helpful. You guys can uh, have fun with this module. And you'll see that it's really not as hard uh, as it looks, uh, but it can be very enjoyable uh, for both crew members. If you got a buddy that you can get involved and get them in the front seat or, or get them in the back seat. And, uh, yeah, I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. I'm excited for you. And I uh, can't wait to hear your response. We'll talk to you guys later. Take it easy.